So yesterday was a wonderful sunny day, and it was a typical Tuesday at the Holocaust Memorial Center. And I thought I'd tell you what happened. The buses began pulling up at 9 o'clock in the morning from Parkside Middle School from Jackson, Michigan. They had traveled an hour and a half to get here. There were 50 eighth graders, their teachers, and their parents. And a little bit later, around 10.30, three really large buses pulled up, 150 eighth graders from Chippewa Valley Schools, and they arrived with their teachers and chaperones also. There was a very well-attended one o'clock tour. There were 40 students from the Ferndale Adult Education Program, and this was followed by 40 students from Davenport University. In addition, there were many walk-in guests. Thanks, thankfully, we had very dedicated docents who took people through the museum yesterday. We had 12 docents who, gave, who spent an hour and a half with each of the school groups and each of the, the guests so that they had a very meaningful experience. But probably, if you would ask each of these people what was the highlight of their visit here, they would all tell you that was sitting in this room just like all of you because after everybody has a one and a half hour tour, they have a survivor speak to them for about 30 minutes. And yesterday, three survivors told their stories to the children and the students and the visitors, and also our German exchange student. And I believe that the visitors' lives were forever changed having had this experience. Every day we impact a new student, a teacher, a class, a family, a parent, an adult, and one by one they learn about the Holocaust and they think about how to create a better, more humane world. And all of you as members sitting in this room are our partners in this important work. So last spring I had, is this Noisy. Last spring, I had a very interesting telephone call. And on the other line, the man said, Cheryl, is this you? This is David Handelman. He said, let's do something that we've never done before. Let's create a cl collaboration that is really unique for our community. And so we began the planning for tonight's evening. And I really want to thank Rose and David Handelman for thinking about the Holocaust Memorial Center and creating this wonderful new partnership with the Michigan Opera Theater. Through opera, um, we are there, we're, try, we're learning to understand the Holocaust in a whole new way. And I also want to thank the Handelmans for bringing the Holocaust education to the Michigan Opera Theater. There's lots of people in this room who deserve special thanks for making this evening possible. So a real short list to our board, to our president, Gary Karp, um, to our staff for their wonderful dedication and hard work, to Beth Snyder, our director of annual giving, to Rebecca Steiner, our director of programs, Jackie Schwartz, Lawrence Willem, and our director, Steve Goldman over here, who is always open to new and wonderful ideas. And we just, um, this afternoon put up a new mem a membership wall out there and I hope that you'll stop by and see it when you're having your desserts later. So a great evening like this deserves great leadership and I would like to thank Elise and David Fulton for being the chairs of tonight's event. They helped to develop the vision and had wonderful ideas for tonight and in addition they brought many new friends to the Holocaust Memorial Center. We're very grateful to them, thank you. And I, I also want to thank them for their dedication to Holocaust awareness and education because it's their creativity and the way they're raising their wonderful children and their, their need to teach the lessons of the Holocaust that inspires all of us. So I'd like to call Annalise to speak with you now and David. Thank you. A little taller than Cheryl. Good evening, I'm Elise Fulton, and on behalf of my husband David and I, I just want to tell you how honored we are to be here tonight and to be chairing this event. I also want to tell you that this group in front of me looks a lot bigger and a lot more stunning than it did from sitting in the front row looking here. You are a beautiful crowd. I'm so happy to see you all here tonight recognizing the Holocaust Memorial Center. Thank you for that. 
David and I are both children of Holocaust survivors, along with my brothers that are here and, and sister-in-law, Gary and Shelley Golden and Craig Golden. And while we've all known all along that we were children of Holocaust survivors, and we've known that that's affected or defined sort of bigger parts of who we are as people, it's not until recently, over the last couple of years, that I realized it defines every aspect of who I am. That although my father was a survivor and, and lived in the woods and could barely you know, speak about the Holocaust, somehow from that I realized as, as an adult now that the Holocaust was in the wallpaper of our home. It was in every breath we took. Because now as an adult, I take a look and I realize that every aspect of who I am, who I am as an adult, who I am as a parent, who I am as a friend and as a spouse, it's defined by my parents bringing me up as a child of a Holocaust survivor. It's been so startling to me, in fact, that more recently I've started a whole initiative interviewing and, and talking with um, Holocaust survivors and largely speaking with children of Holocaust survivors to really identify who we are and how has this affected us. And I think it's affected us more so, or, or as adults, it's important to recognize how we see the world. So as a, as a side, if any of you are interested in being part of this, Please feel free to contact me later. But this whole um, sort of awakening or journey that I've been on has led us um, through our friends, the Weisbergs, to the Holocaust Memorial Center and to tonight. And we couldn't be more honored than to be here in front of you tonight and to be celebrating a remarkable um, Holocaust survivor who we had the opportunity to spend an evening with yesterday, Ella Weisberger. Um, so thank you for having us. And I'll allow my husband, David, to say a few words. Uh, thanks, Elise. Uh, first of all, um, you were too generous with the Fultons. Elise is really responsible for all the ideas and all the fun here. I show up. But Cheryl, thank you for giving me credit. Uh, like Elise, uh, I too am defined by being the child of survivors. Um, my parents, I lived in the same roof. I was mentored by a couple who basically shared a biblical experience. They survived a madman who wanted to exterminate their people. And after they survived, they made an exodus to a new country and started a new life for their family. And all with a love of life. We were never brought up to hate anyone. We were never brought up to be bitter. We were brought up to live in the now and the future. In fact, I was telling Cheryl, most of what I know about my parents' struggles I don't know from them, I know from others, because they just didn't talk about it. My mother's main mission in life was for me to have high goals and high achievements uh, in honor of those who couldn't. My father's main mission in life was for me to have a really good time in life and enjoy things for those who couldn't. Um, and as I am here today, I, I just think so much of my strengths and so many of my weaknesses are either genetic from the things that made them survivors or are environmental because being taught that by survivors. You know, when you think about that, my, my parents were enormously confident people. They were very secure. They survived something remarkable and they were very proud of it. They were smart. They were adaptive. Um, they knew they were incredibly self-aware. You can't you can't get through something horrible without knowing your strengths and weaknesses and dealing with each. They were great people reads. They knew who to trust. They knew who not to trust. They knew what door to walk into, what door not to walk into, and they were lucky. And luck is not a bad thing to have in life. Um, and I genuinely feel today that I am the beneficiary of their strength, all that they were, and they've given me many, many great gifts. But I think my favorite gift is here. It's Elise and my family. If I were not a Holocaust survivor, I don't think we'd be married. I don't think we'd have these beautiful children. And I will end on a story um, of how this came to be. Elise and I worked together. Elise was an executive at a company, and I was their lawyer. We had a very small group. We worked together. Detroit Jewish community is a very small community. Everybody was trying to fix us up, everyone. <laughs> we really weren't that interested. We admired each other professionally. We liked each other a lot. We cared about each other's professionals, but there was no spark. 
And then one day, Elise and I, about two-thirds of the way through our professional journey, were flying back from New York with Elise's colleague, who happened to be my dear friend, and in the Who Would Hide Me game that we all play, he's a non-Jew who would hide us. And we're sitting there on the plane, Elise and he are here, and I'm here. And the topic of the Bosnian situation comes up. And he calls it a Holocaust. Not out of any anger or malice, he didn't know. So I called him on it in a nice way, and Elise chimed in. And I could tell from the way that Elise chimed in, she was not talking intellectually. She was talking from the heart. So immediately I asked her, where are your parents from? And in that moment, I learned that she too was a child of a survivor, didn't come from the part of the world my parents did, but close enough. And in that moment, I knew two things. I was in love with her, <laughs> and we were going to get married and have a family. So the first part is probably pretty obvious to you. It's pretty easy. Take a look at her, take a look at me. It's pretty easy to fall in love, wouldn't you say? But the second part, knowing in that moment that we would be together, that's a Holocaust survivor's child's gift, because I learned to shoot high, to have the confidence that I could get what I wanted, and that it was my job to work hard to get it. So here we are. Thank you all. We're delighted to be part of this, and we can't wait to hear our new dear friend uh, later in the evening. Thank you all. Thank you, sweetheart. I do want to introduce uh, a very important component of this evening, Michael Yashinsky, who is the producer of Brindle Bar at the Detroit Opera House Michigan Opera Theater. And um, he will be your next speaker. He's had a, a huge role in this, as you might imagine. Thank you, Michael. So. Uh, hello. This one? All right. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, I'm Michael Yashinsky. I'm directing the production of Brinde Bar, which will be taking place on Sunday, March 16th at 2.30 at the Opera House, Detroit Opera House downtown. Um, it's been a wonderful experience. This isn't an opera like other operas, this Brinde Bar that Ella Stein Weisberger was in in Theresienstadt. Um, a lot of operas are musically beautiful, dramatically captivating. Um, it's rare that I get to work on an opera that has such emotional significance, such historical value, such moral value to the people performing it. And that's something that I've been discovering in my work with our performers, who are a wonderful bunch, and we have some of them today, and they'll be performing a bit later, a couple songs from the show. Um, really sensitive and intelligent kids uh, with whom I'm able to have sensitive and intelligent conversations about this history, and they really get it. Um, the first day, instead of going right into staging the opera, we just um, spent an hour and a half just talking about the history and talking about Ella, and it was very inspiring to me to hear what these kids had to say and how they were moved by the stories that I was telling them of the kids who were in Theresienstadt. Um, and talking with Ella on the phone has also been inspiring because I've had phone conversations with her throughout this process, and that's something that's driven me forward. So it's, it's very unique that I've had this experience with an opera, this emotional experience, um, because it is so special, as I'll tell you, the history of the opera. Well, first, it's Purim time. Purim is coming up. This is Purim in 1939 in Eastern Europe, kids celebrating Purim which of course celebrates Jewish triumph over these Persian tyrants who sought to destroy the Jews and in ancient times we came and their plot did not work and we rebelled against them in great numbers and of course every year at Purim we celebrate this victory. These are kids masquerading, um, dressed up for Purim. And these are our kids now and it's Purim time now. Purim time will be when we're performing this opera. And it has that real special historical connection doing it on Purim because Purim celebrates, um, Purim commemorates um, events in our national history 
where tyrants rose up and sought to destroy us. And Purim is often celebrated with a Purim spiel. You get together and put on a play and celebrate Purim that way. So in, in a way, this Brundabar is our Purim spiel for Purim 2014. Here are our kids rehearsing for the opera. Um, Theresienstadt was a concentration camp in Czechoslovakia near Prague. It was the model ghetto. They put, it was called the model ghetto. They put a lot of artists there and intellectuals and had performances and gave the camp a veneer of some sort of humane living that the Jews there could enjoy entertainments um, such as Brundabar, such as various piano concerts by Alice Summer Hertz, who is the oldest living Holocaust survivor who just passed away. Um, that's what the camp was. Of course, life there was extremely hard and they suffered and many died just as in any other camp. But it was a unique camp in this way from which many, art, many uh, artworks survive, including this opera, this Brundabar, which tells the story of a boy and girl and Brundabar is the organ grinder who's seeking to dominate them and they rise up against him with a cat and a dog and a sparrow and you'll see what happens at the end if you come Sunday. <laughs> um, this is a picture done by Bedrich Frita, who lived in Theresienstadt, was interned there, drew a picture of someone playing accordion for his fellow inmates in the camp. There were all these pictures that survive. Um, music, many concerts took place in the camp. This is actually a poster for a group that called themselves the Ghetto Swingers. Uh, so you can see they didn't lose their spirit, their sense of humor, even in the depths of this misery. Um, a group calling themselves the Ghetto Swingers, playing this light music, this Unterhaltungsmusik. Um, this is a picture done by our guest today, Ella Stein Weisberger, in the camp. Um, the kids created many pictures. They had a teacher, Friedel Dicker Brandeis, who would come secretly to the barracks and salvage any documents, scraps she could find, said, give me any scraps of paper you have because I'm going to use them for my kids. And she would come and secretly teach them art. And all of these pictures survive from the camp, like Ella's here, which depicts a marketplace. I thought this one was particularly interesting because the opera Brundibar opens with a sort of marketplace setting. And I, I wonder if, Ella, you were inspired by that setting in creating this picture. Maybe, maybe not, but it does have a real connection. Um, Krasa, uh, uh, Hans Krasa, Adolf Hofmeister. Hans Krasa in the light coat and Adolf Hofmeister in the dark one wrote Brundibar, Krasa the music, Hofmeister the words. Um, wrote it 1938 to 1939, but 1939 before the war, then the score was smuggled into the camp. Um, we're using a translation done by these two, Maurice Sendak, Tony Kushner, great Jewish artists of our time. Um, Kushner wrote this translation for a production designed by Maurice Sendak, and that's a picture of a picture book they did of Brundibar. A very nice translation, very clever and full of humor, which Brundibar is. Although it came from this very dark place in history, it's actually a very lighthearted, fun, amusing opera with sparkling, bright music. Um, that can be enjoyed by any kid and is meant for kids and is meant for kids to sing. We have 80 kids singing in our production. Poster for our opera. And various, uh, March 16th, 2.30, various pictures of rehearsal. There is Brundibar in the center, who we have with us today uh, in rehearsal as the organ grinder. Uh, there is the girl who's playing the cat, which was Ella's role, um, as she'll tell us. and pictures that will look like the performance that we'll put on in our set. Um, this is a picture of the Theresienstadt cast of Brundibar that was taken, it's a still from a propaganda film that was created in the camp um, and used by the Nazis to spread this myth about Theresienstadt being a model ghetto. For it, they filmed a performance of Brundabar, and you can see there Hansa Treichlinger, Treichlinger in the center as Brundabar with a mustache, and to the right of him there in all black with whiskers on her face is Ella. Um, and you can see her feet have also been darkened with um, 
black shoe polish, I believe, uh, to look like the cat. Um, amazing that we still have these images of these kids, most of whom would not survive. Um, Hansa Treiklinger, I just want to read one quote about him. Um, Rudolf Freudenfeld, who smuggled the score of Brundebar into the camp, would survive, and he would later talk about Honza. He said this about Honza. Um, Honza was playing the villain. He said, quite, instinct quite instinctively, he made the character of Brundebar so human that although he played a wicked character, he became the darling of the audience, and not only of the children in the audience. He learned to twitch the whiskers which we stuck under his nose. He twitched them so well and at just the right time that tension relaxed in the auditorium and often we could hear the children releasing their bated breath. What might he have become? Actor or engineer? How he could have humanized his own life as he had his role. He was 14 years old. He went to Auschwitz with the old and the small children and directly into the gas chamber. Uh, in October of 1944, Honza and most of these children in the cast of Brundebar in the camp were sent on a train to the east and never came back. There's Honza Treichlinger, this great actor. Ella tells me he would have become a great star because um, he really had an innate talent. Another boy who lived in Theresienstadt, Peter Ginz, and edited this newspaper called Videm. This is one of his pictures that was actually taken up into space by Ilan Ramon on that ill-fated journey into space. Uh, one of the pictures that he did in the camp. A piece was written in this Videm, this underground camp newspaper, which means we lead, about Brundebar. One of the cast members wrote it for this newsletter. He said in it, Rafik Schechter, who was the musical director, had worked hard. He wrote this in the, in the camp newspaper during, in 1944. Had worked so hard so we could sing nicely. And when we had finished and the hall was filled with thunderous applause, we were all happy and content, for man is a creature eager for fame. Brundebar will soon disappear from the minds of those who saw it in the camp, but for us participants, it will remain one of the few beautiful memories which we will have from Theresen. So they lived this hard life, this hard existence in the camp, struggling every day. And yet this, Brundebar, this children's opera, was for them a beautiful experience, as it has been for us. There's a poster that was created in the camp for Brundebar. And Ella, you can see here, as a child, holding flowers. And there she is, among her castmates in Brundebar, circled there as the cat. And here she is with a bunch of children. She goes all over the world speaking with children, going to Brindabar performances and inspiring us. Um, so there's many in the world who have been touched by Ella's story and Ella's spirit. Um, and our cast and I myself and everyone at the Opera House, we are among those now who have been touched very much by Ella. As you can see, these kids are, clearly. Um, so that's, that's the story of Theresienstadt and Ella Weisberger's role in it, and its place in the camp, and its place in the hearts of um, kids who are performing it now all the time. There's performances of Brindabar going on everywhere around the world. Um, it's a very special thing, and Ella is a very special person. Um, so I think we're all eager to hear from her now, and hear her stories um, for she's full of them. So, full of wonderful stories. These are various pictures of Ella's that she did while in the camp under the instruction of this Friedel Dicker Brandeis. Um, so Ella, you can talk about these pictures, you can talk about whatever you like, and we're very grateful to have you here. And um, thank you very much, Ella Stein Weisberger. I think I don't have to introduce myself. <laughs> I was introduced the really nice way. Thank you, Todaraba. Now I don't know how to start. 
but one thing I will start with. This year, it's 70 years that we first performed in Terezienstadt, Brunjiva. So, you know, I was very young, so now you know approximately how old I am. <laughs> this I don't have to announce. But it meant so much to us. And I think that it will make you a little clearer what Theresienstadt, you know, really was. It was a place that the music, Brunjibal, our children paintings and the poems of children of Terezin. And you can find them in the book, I Never Saw Another Butterfly. I forgot to put my butterfly. We are getting and giving butterfly because we are free. But I have to really tell you the start how it happened in Czech Republic. It started really with Kristalna that I went through, but I was very young. I was eight years old, and I was listening sometimes when my father had the radio on and Hitler's speech, you know, I only heard the Juden, the Juden. So, I was covering my ears. I didn't want it to hear that anymore. But I was afraid of him even that I didn't see him that time. By the way, I have to say, I saw him alive when I was living for a short time with my grandmother in the town of Brno, Brno that was very close to Vienna. And uh, we were taken out of school to greet Hitler. When I only heard the word Hitler, I was scared. But I was outside greeting Hitler. My sister is four years older, so her teacher was really very enthusiastic about Hitler because the town of Brno was like half for Hitler and half against. So my teacher said, you don't have to heil. Only stay and be quiet. So I have a little book that is called The Cat with a Yellow Star. And I'm talking in school to children that uh, I saw Hitler alive and nobody, even the teachers, didn't believe me. So I had a meeting not long ago in Los Angeles with Yehuda Bauer, and I gave him my book, but in a new book called Terezin, I opened up, and there was the picture of Hitler coming to Brno, to Brin. Right away, I made a copy of it, and he said, you know, Bella, I never heard from a survivor that they saw Hitler alive. But now I see that you have a proof. Because underneath of it, it says Hitler coming the 19th of March to take over Czech Republic. And on the way, he stopped with it big car, this big Mercedes Benz. And this was the end for us Jews, really. Okay, you know, there are a lot of stories. And Mike said, I have only 15 minutes, so I have to put in. But uh, for me, I just want to tell you that it was a terrible time when we were registered in Prague as Jews, and it was given to us this. This is the Jewish star, that it's mine, the first one that I got. And it says Jude, that it means Jew, 
And now I know that the Holland people had written Judd, the French people, Jeff. But everybody knew that this star, we were marked. For me, this star meant a lot of other things. First of all, now this is my lucky star. I wouldn't be ashamed to wear it. I am Jewish. I was soldier in Israeli army. And another thing, when we performed Brunjivar, we didn't have to wear it. They let us take it off. So I always mentioned it was a couple minutes of freedom. We were free. We weren't marked. I spent it my childhood, really, in Terezin. I was there for three and a half years, and uh, it was bad. But I survived. There are a couple things that I just want to share with you because I don't know if everybody knows about those things. With my Jewish star, I have this. This is the number of my cousin that he was the first one in Terezianstadt. And we had to wear it on our neck. And when I was a student of Friedrich Brandeis, one day when we were drawing those little children's paintings, but now I wasn't so bad. I did a couple good ones. So she said to us, children, you are not a number. You have a name. Please write down on those children paintings your name in any language that you please, your birthday, the room that you we were spending so much time in. This was room 28. Probably now you can read the book, The Girls from Room 28. And she was such a wonderful person because we were separated and many of us were already orphans in Terezin. I was very lucky. I had my mother and my sister was in room 29, but she wasn't nice to me too much. She was already a big girl, you know. But uh, I will show you one thing that I still have, what I did in Terezin. And uh, this was also what Friedel was telling us kids. Anything that you can hold between your fingers, you can create something. You can create sometimes something beautiful and you will enjoy it. Sometimes you can create something that you can make a gift to somebody. Can you imagine I live in my house 53 years? I never threw out anything. <laughs> what she was telling me not to throw out anything. So this piece of wood, the plywood, I found it. She lent me a tiny um, magnifying glass and I was sitting on the window and I burned out the symbol of Theresienstadt in the back. I wrote in Czech, Mamince, it means to mother, Ella. I don't know where I found this piece of thread, but I gave it for my mother for Mother's Day. She had it hanging all, those, all that time in Theresienstadt. After in Prague, everywhere she was hanging this thing. And she said, Alinka, I never got 
such a beautiful present for Mother's Day. Please don't give it to uh, any museums and anything. So it is still with me. And my daughter, I wanted her to have it now. She said, Ma, enjoy it still. There is only one mother. And I miss my mother very much. Because she helped not only me, but also to other kids that didn't have mothers. And my mother was working in the agriculture department. And I can say it now, there are not such a little, little kids that I would be embarrassed. But my mother lost a lot of weight. So her bra was very big. So when it, she had customers for things that she was smuggled in, into the camp, and what the most valuable things were tomatoes. So she smuggled in the bra 50 tomatoes. <laughs> and she never squished any. So she was able to exchange them because some people from Denmark was getting from Swedish king little packages with sardines and a couple things. So she would be able to exchange it for a little bread or sugar. So, you know, I think it helped me to be like that. <laughs> but they were many other things that they are connected with all that because she was almost killed for radishes to smuggle in for Passover. There were a couple people that they said it's soon Passover. Can you smuggle for us in something green or something that we can put on our plate? So, radishes was the first thing that was growing in the fields. So, my mother took big, you know, package with radishes. And when she came to the gates, you know, the residents that the fortress had entered, there were already the Nazi women standing and stopping to control. Now my mother knew that this will be her end if they will find the radishes. So she was standing at the last couple of people and she started to eat them with the green, with the dirt, everything. Because they stripped them naked that nobody was able to put them in a package, you know, nothing. And there was a young girl and she was crying and my mother asked, what are you crying? And she said, I have two radishes and I can eat them. So my mother said, give it to me. And she was eating even the young girls, you know, what they were smuggling in radishes with the dirt, with the green. But she saved lives, many of them. I'm looking at Michael because he has to. <laughs> I will talk about something else that probably is something that you never heard before either. I have with me something. This is from Rabbi Feder the Czech rabbi that I knew from a little town of Kolin. And he was not only good rabbi, he also was giving us hope. And uh, he survived with me in Terezin. He became the head rabbi of Czechoslovakia after the war. But I inherited something from him. 
I inherited his talents. And uh, there is in Denver is a synagogue, little synagogue, that they have the Torah. From Colleen, there were many, many Torahs, but the main one was straight in Colleen City. And they built it around this Torah synagogue. And they have even parts of the furniture from the Torah from Colleen. I know they would like, love to have this, but we are using it at my daughter's wedding, at my son's bar mitzvah, my sister's kids had bar mitzvah, and my son and brother-in-law was wearing it. But again, people were telling me, how you know that this talus belongs to Rabbi Feder? I said, I don't lie. I don't lie. I never lied. My mother forbid me to lie because she said if they will find a new a little thing from the gardens, you will be punished. So don't, she, you know, stole things for me, more than I would do. But I really listened. I never stole anything and I didn't lie. But I was last year in Kibbutz Givat Chayim, that's a Czech kibbutz, not anymore Czech because they separated, and, but uh, we have their museum, Beth Terezin, and this rabbi's niece is still alive, so I asked her, Alisa, by any chance you have some pictures, old pictures of your uncle, and she said, I think so, that I will have some. I got the picture <laughs> from her. In this picture, he is wearing this talus. And you know that Czech rabbis didn't wear yamarkat. They wore those hats. So everybody who knew a Czech rabbi, they knew that he had this head. So now, that wasn't a lie, and Denver would love to have this, but I'm not giving it away now. <laughs> they, they probably would pay me a lot of money for it, but money is not always good. So, you know, when I'm speaking about Friel Brandeis, I remember such a details, like she would talk to me. So there is one thing that I think would be nice to say. When it was a beautiful spring day, uh, Theresienstadt is surrounded by mountains. She would take us kids to the window and she would say, kids, look out. It's a beautiful day. The sun is above those mountains. But what is really important is behind those mountains. Behind those mountains is hope that you will maybe survive. So here I am. I survived. There are, you know, a lot of people asking me, how come that you survived and other kids didn't? This was only luck. That my uncle, who was to me like father, was in Theresienstadt in underground. And he was sent with the last transport from Theresienstadt, what was the 28th of October, 1944. And 28th of October was even in Theresienstadt, big holiday for us Czechs. 
This was the day that Czech Republic was based with Slovaks still. Because you know that Slovaks were separated under the communist day went different ways. And we celebrated that town. I was hidden under my uncle's bed because I really wanted to go with him. And when they opened the door to the train, I didn't have the number. So they didn't get me through to the train. So this way. I survived. But my friend didn't. So now I'm dedicating my life to speak for those children that didn't survive. I feel that I speak in their voice. I feel that the world should know that million and a half Jewish children were murdered. For what? Because only that they were Jewish. So we should not forget them. So I have a little poem that was written by Ilse Weber. She was not only a musician, she smuggled into Theresienstadt guitar. One child was saved in Sweden, and one child was with her in Theresienstadt. So she wrote poems and songs. When she became a nurse for the little children's hospital, I remember that she was taking the children outside for little air when they were so sick and she would play the guitar and telling them those poems and those songs that she wrote for them. So I really had always in mind one poem. And I decided that my children should know that poem and to know who is a friend. I had lots of friends, and I still have friends. You know, I don't want to disappoint you <laughs> with that. You know, when I see such a beautiful town now again, Detroit became, becomes again beautiful town with a lot of Jews in there. <laughs> so I always say, you know, if you want to adopt me, I will, I am adaptable. <laughs> Who wants an old bag like me, you know? But I will finish with this little poem about friends. And you and I, and we are friends. And you and I, we are in love. In Terezin we met, friends in need, hand in hand, and you and I, friends we still be, and you and I shall never forget. So please, remember also my friends, and thank you for listening to me. You didn't have to go. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ella. Okay. I will repeat that. All right. Very good. Yes, come and take. Thank you so much, Ella. Um, your stories are so inspiring to all of us. An inspiring life, really, a whole, a whole lifetime. Nobly lived and uh, setting an example for us all. Um, 
So that's not all. We still have a little excerpt from our performance. Um, obviously, when you'll see it on stage at the Opera House, there will be lights and costumes and 80 kids, so I wouldn't miss it. There's really nothing like seeing 80 kids from this area, all these youths aged 8 to 16, singing together with a full orchestra and Ella joining them on stage. It'll be something um, that you won't ever forget. Um, we'll have a couple of these songs, not with the costumes and all the movements that we'll have on stage, but a little taste. Um, first, uh, Miles Eichenhorn, as Brindabar, will sing um, Brindabar's song, uh, Brindabar's big introductory song. Um, Brindabar is the organ grinder, the villain, and he's singing about his uh, hatred for children, <laughs> um, but in a comic sort of way. And I should note that the musical director of our performance is Diana Hoshella, and the director of the Michigan Opera Theater Children's Chorus, which is the organization that's putting on this opera, is Suzanne Acton, who will be accompanying Miles and the other performers today. So if you'd please come up and, um, yeah. <laughs> Little children, how I hate them, how I wish the bedbugs ate them, how their parents overrate them, if they're rude, exterminate them. Nasty little children, quiet, don't be loud, don't even try it, you'll find out what troubles are if you bother Brundibar. Here's a secret, don't disclose it, best for me if no one knows it. When I was a tiny sprout, everybody drowned me out. When I was a tender puppy, every bully beat me up. -y. I was beaten but unbound. I grew bigger, I got loud. I got louder, I got taller, then I noticed some are smaller. Also, look, oh glory be, they are all afraid of me. Everyone will be my flunky, just an organ grinder's monkey. If you need an explanation, I've a need for domination. Everybody step and sway now to the tune my organs play and my way is the only way now and there'll be no disobeying. I'm the loudest one by far, the organ grinder Brundibar. Thank you, Miles and Suzanne. And now the, this is the final chorus from the show, so we'd like to welcome the other kids from the Michigan Opera Theater Children's Chorus who are here, a small sampling. This is uh, Jenya Footit and her brother Jaden Footit and Miles' brother, Eddie Eichenhorn, and Christina Nash. So this is the final chorus from the show. Um, the kids sing all together. And we'll be joined uh, towards the end by a special guest who will be singing in the original language of the piece, which is Czech. Our kids are singing in English. Ella will join us and sing in Czech. Um, yeah. Um, so, whenever you're ready. Trombone and kettle drum, the villains overcome. Strum it on your guitar, farewell to Brundy Bar. And what's the cause of it? Listen up, we won't solve it. Listen, we never quit. You'll find that trouble ends when you rely on friends. That's the whole point of it. Ladies and gentlemen, and mostly children, Thank you, etc. Thus ends our opera. That's all the tale to tell. We too had best be stir. Mommy's not feeling well, and we have milk for her.
another hand for these great kids. direction. The Michigan Opera Theater will perform the entire opera this Sunday, March 16th from 2.30 to 3.30 with, this, with these kids plus about uh, 74 more in the magnificent Detroit Opera House. Complete orchestra, intricate staging, beautiful costumes, full lighting, and full jewel-colored sets. This is an original play of interwoven art and poetry from Theresienstadt, followed by a talk from Ella, by Ella Stein Weisberger, who will join the children once again. Tickets are available at Metro, Met, M O T O P E R A, Moto, Moto Opera, that's good, <laughs> dot org, 313237 uh, Sing, or at the Opera House, including just before the performance. The Opera House is at 1526 Broadway. It will be an unforgettable, one-of-a-kind theatrical experience. I've seen it before. It will move you. It will excite you. And it will bring you closer to this important piece of history. I want to thank all the folks from uh, the opera company who have come and, and helped us, joined with us, cooperated with us in this, in this new kind of a program. Uh, Michael. Thank you for your words and teaching us a little bit about this history. And I want to thank you, all of you, my friends, for coming this evening. Look at the size of this crowd. Our members, this was a special members only event. It is a way to thank you for your support, without which we cannot operate. Every dollar, every membership is so important to us because you, our members, are our one renewable resource. Thank you for coming. Please join us for a little food. What do we do with it? We, we don't do anything without eating. You know the Passover story? <laughs> the short Haggadah. They hate us. They tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. Bateo <laughs> Avon, thank you for coming. <laughs>